Here's a list of 10 anti-Asian stereotypes that need to be destroyed right now. And we're going to talk about which ones can be broken by Asians. And then also which ones are a little bit harder and might last a while. Yeah, we got to talk about this viral list written by Next Shark Andrew. Anytime a author writes a listicle talking about serious things, strong statements, there are a lot of comments generated on the internet. Mm, yeah, and actually, I really like this list. Shout out to the author. They thought of some pretty good stereotypes. We're going to go through it. We'll talk about which ones are the most true, low, middle, high. And then also we're just going to talk about maybe like how we can break them and generally the conversation around it all. So make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications guys and let's get into it and real quick the definition of a stereotype is a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing the sentence they give is the stereotype of a woman is as a caregiver or caretaker obviously women in a hospital setting are stereotyped to be the nurses yeah and um i think when a stereotype crosses over into negativity is because it's used a certain way. Like, oh, all Asians are this way. All blah, blah, blah is this way. And those kind of like definitive statements are kind of, those are the ones that cause the problem. Right, but it is true that literally every human on earth uses some form of generalization, archetyping, categorization, right. or even stereotyping in day-to-day -day life. Let, let me just to give be you fair, a, let's keep it real. Let me give you a quick suggestion. Maybe you just say, generally, I feel like I've seen most Asians do this. That statement is a lot less problematic than saying, oh, Asians are like this. You know what I mean? Let's Anyways. Get, <laughs> anyway, let's get into it, man. Andrew, number one, model minority. The article states, the model minority is obviously the most common stereotype that AAPIs have always faced. This myth lumps together Asian Americans as a monolithic group of high achieving and hardworking individuals who, the, uh, who reach the American dream through a rigid upbringing, top education, and unparalleled work ethic. Yeah, man. So the, on the stereotype that Asians are the model minority, David, how true would you say it is low, middle, high? Real Realistically, guys, and we only got low, middle, highest choices. I'm going to go ahead and say truthiness wise, it's middle okay. because some groups absolutely fit this. Maybe to even themselves, they tell themselves this story to a 10 out of 10 level. Let's just throw it out there. Taiwanese Americans. I'm generally? just saying generally. And then obviously you got another group that may not fit the model minority myth or archetype. Cambodian Americans. Right. Um, and I would say this. Here's the thing about this stereotype that makes it unique from the other stereotypes is that the model minority one within Asians, and a lot of Asians don't like to admit it, but a lot of parents would admit this, that they don't think this is a bad stereotype. They think it's a positive one. Yeah, and to be honest, if I talk to my black or Latino friends, they'd be like, I mean, yeah, I could think of a lot worse stereotypes, guys. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's not clearly a negative one, although it does have a, a slightly negative impact, obviously, for the Asians that don't fit into the model minority stereotype. They don't really get acknowledged, so that right, is And they the don't negative. get help from the government programs they yes. need because of disaggregation. Yeah, you know? and people assume, oh, well, you're Asian, so you're just doing good. It doesn't matter what type of Asian you are, right? You're a model minority. Now, but I will say, when it comes to being high achievers, that in a nut is not necessarily the worst thing to it's be, gonna right? It's going to be tough to get people to like all live life in the opposite direction just to break this stereotype, right? right? For example, like I don't think that my Mexican friends want to stop being considered hardworking or my black American friends want to stop being considered like charismatic. Right. You know what I mean? Because those are Everybody has positive and negative stereotypes about groups, but those are the more positive ones, right? So it's hard to get people to go against something they feel like is generally good. Yeah, I guess one way to kind of help break it is just acknowledge that probably half of Asians don't even fall into the model minority myth at all, you know? And then also just acknowledge like the other groups of Asians. Like for us, we're always there to highlight other cultures and acknowledge the differences. And I think you can be different and together under the umbrella of Asian, but- and I think you have to see the value- in the groups that don't fit into the model minority yes. because they have their own unique set of experiences. They've survived a unique set of circumstances that everybody mm -hmm. can take something away from. And, and also in America, there are so many different careers and ways to make money. And I think we need to acknowledge that a lot of other Asians who don't fit into the model minority myth have careers in another sector and that we is still very respectable and we need to respect that. Moving on to number two, perpetual foreigner. This assumes that AAPIs are not true Americans because they just arrived here post-1965 in large numbers. I would say that Latinos get this perpetual foreigner card a little bit, but certainly white or black people that are heritage Americans for 300, 400, 500 years certainly uh, do not have this, right? Yeah, I think it's also because Asians, we visually look different, so there's no way for us to disguise ourselves as like American or 
white because we just look different than white or black people. Right. You're saying in the same way that somebody like Chris Helmsworth is from Australia or New Zealand, but then they can come to America and play like an all-American badass. Dude. Way easier than us, even if we're born and raised I mean, in I'm even talking about Luka Doncic, whose English is probably his third language. And if you put a cowboy hat on him, he's just walking around Dallas just like a big cowboy like anybody else. But uh, I guess overall, man, this is a tough situation because... Um, I think Asian culture at its core, like true Asian culture is very different than Western culture. So the more you're into Asian culture, and by the way, Asian culture is on the rise in media, whether it be K-pop, the food, right. just Chinese culture in general, Vietnamese culture, Filipino culture. So if everybody wants to celebrate and highlight these cultures more, and it's considered different than the general American culture. Or Western hemisphere culture in general, let alone Anglo-Saxon or yeah, Western European norms. it will always feel like we're part of a different culture and therefore a foreigner. So yeah. how do you balance assimilation to appreciation to holding on to your own roots? Hard question. I'm going to go ahead and rank perpetual foreigner at a medium level too. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to pick just mid all the time as a cop out, but I really think so. And I think that, like you said, there's a visual factor, but there's also like a cultural factor. Like I feel like my Filipino friends growing up felt less of this pressure or this, uh, P perpetual foreigner label on them because mm -hmm. of visual ambiguity, but also cultural Latinization or Westernization. Yeah. So and I, and I think my Chinese friends feel it the most because my Chinese friends tend to be like the least Westernized even compared to my Korean or Filipino friends. Yeah, and also there is like probably the most Chinese people coming over. Also, I think there's obviously big uh, populations in the brown countries, the daisy countries. Do so you break over. this myth, Andrew, by acting extra Americana in middle American, like 1960s uh, middle of America culture? Or is it like changing the fabric of and, and, and throwing your your culture in the potluck you, you know what's always like a brain fudge for a lot of like blue uh, like americans who are not exposed to a lot of different types of asians it's like when you're very asian but you do one or two things that is super american like our comedian friend pung he's a, he's a fob from from China, but then he's super good at shooting guns. So when he goes to this gun range, all the white people are like, whoa, like you are American Pung? But then Pung's like from China. So it's like, I think it's kind of funny, like if you can do one of those things, or if you can have a really good sense of humor about it, humor is very, I guess, in a way, Western. I don't want to say humor is only from the West, but at least if you do the Western style of humor, it can kind of humanize yourself and you will be less of a Certainly perpetual Certainly from foreigner. a mechanical, just logistical standpoint, jumping two feet first into something that is commonly associated associated with being American is a tactic, but yeah. I'm not telling everybody they got to do it. I don't think it. you should, you need to American wash yourself, but pick up a couple things of American culture that really connect with people and it'll help. Moving on to yellow peril number Ooh. three, Andrew. Um, the author says it comes from the 19th century, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, when they thought all these low paid workers would come through and take all the Irish people's jobs. Obviously the Irish were already outsided by the, the original Germans and British people that were here in America or Dutch people. Um, but you actually have a theory, Andrew, it actually comes from the 12th century. So I think the term might have been coined in the 1900s. And then obviously, you know, the J World War II with the Japanese, that was also another sh uh, level of yellow peril, by the way. And then now we're in current one. But looking way back to history, because I know Western Europe, they love their history, guys. So let's not forget that Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire did did take over a lot of Asia and Europe. Oh, it pushed all the way to Poland yeah, in the 12th century. But they didn't make it to Western Europe, but Western Europe knows that the Mo Mongolian Empire almost did. So I feel like that there's also a sense of that being like, oh man, the Mongols, man, they they, they did it a long time ago and no, now, hey, now it's the uh, Chinese. Hey, hey, they eat raw meat. How, how could the Mongols eat the raw meat? That is what the, their advantage is to push westward. Um, um, obviously nowadays in 2023, it's a lot more economic. I believe Florida just banned China Chinese citizens from buying property. Uh, it's probably going to happen man, in Texas. You know what's like crazy, so, man? You know what's more, crazy about this, David? Chinese, it's like the second wave of Chinese yellow peril right now. You because mean, since of, 1882. First, the first wave was the, like, the Exclusion Act era, gold rush. These opium smoking, bald headed oh, cues. They got the cute, the, the ponytails in the back. It's weird, oh, man. man. We're all going to be eating chops. I mean, honestly, chow let's mein. be honest. I think the yellow peril thing mostly applies to men more than women. I think it applies to everybody. But if you, when you're thinking of yellow peril, you're definitely thinking of a yellow man. Somehow. Yeah, but I do think it applies more to the country and the economy in general at this point. I don't know if people are really afraid that China's going to maliciously invade America with boots on the ground. I don't think most people think that, but they do think that they're going to steal the property. Um, 
buy a property, own things, anyways like that. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I think the yellow peril thing, if you really understand it at a macro geopolitical level, I'm going to go ahead and put this at a high. Yeah. Like low, middle, high. I'm going to rank this stereotype at high. This yeah. is... Obviously, not that the, the, that we are perilous, but like the the belief in yellow peril is at a high level. No, I would I say think so. to break it. I don't know what Asian Americans can do. Yeah, it's not really on us as individuals, but I think one thing we can do is not fear monger if we don't have to. Like, I think you can stand tall as who you are and love your identity and love your culture without throwing it in people's face and be like, China's taking over. China's going to be the number one economy. India is going to be the most populated country this year. So ha ha ha. And then I'm like, well, if you're in America, you know, there's no need to do that, guys. But. For sure. I mean, I think if we were to look at it in a geopolitical way, it's almost like you don't want to be a sore loser. You don't want to be a sore winner. Obviously, whatever it even means to win anyway, of course, is like debatable on a macro. But yeah, level. obviously the media is wrong. And then obviously there's a lot of states who are banning Chinese people from buying property. You know, that, that's a really if tough If they're just situation. trying to stabilize their housing prices, I think that's way more logical than just fear mongering. Yeah, I wish, I wish they would focus more on the economy than the enemy. Point number four, Andrew, the COVID starter. This is probably the most recent anti-Asian stereotype highlighted by Carl Sampson for Next Shark. I mean, he's talking about leading anywhere from microaggressions, obviously a way to, to the most serious uh, killings oh, of yeah. Asian people, right? Yeah, at the peak, obviously it was high. I would rank this as high um, at the peak of it. But I do think nowadays it's going to low middle. You know, I think it's cooled off a lot. In my opinion, I do think more and more people are out there to defend Asians when it comes to these accusations about COVID spreader. Like if an Asian person's coughing on the subway or in your, in your nearby you and you say, ah, oh, COVID spreader. Like a bunch of people are going to look at you like, come on. Remember man, we crazy. were in LA when COVID first hit. And I remember I was walking in the street and I, I don't know how to say it. unhoused people were moving around me like I was the source of the No, outbreak. they were avoiding us. I had never felt that force field effect on myself yeah, right crazy, now. Yeah. I mean, how to break it, I don't really know so, how to so break it. You know, this kind of goes to the yellow peril yeah. thing where I'm like, yeah, this no. is almost such an overarching uh, global movement. Is but. When it comes to these kind of accusations that ultimately people feel strongly, but they actually don't know a lot about it, if you just question them back and be like, oh, why do you believe that? Why is it this way? Tell me why. Where did you get this from? Where did you get your information from? And if you ask enough questions, trust me, 90% of the people end up sounding really stupid. Right. And plus a lot of people that would theoretically hate you for starting COVID, they don't even believe in COVID. So I'm going to go ahead and give this one a low right now in right. 2023. Moving on to number five, Andrew, the dog, cat, rat, bad eater. The mandarins eating pangolins. Um... Yeah, this is a stereotype you see on a lot of people. I remember people used to talk about South Korea a lot. People talk about the Yulin Dog Festival in Guangxi, China, which is, unfortunately, it is a real thing. Obviously, do I think in East Asia or Asia in general, I think less than 1% of people have ever had dog. It's way below yeah. 1%. But obviously, yeah, do I think the West might even have a way lower percentage of people who have possibly tried it. But yeah, it's below 1%. Yeah, and then also I think a lot of people are basing this off the re- posted videos that they see from like, you know, Chinese social media where like people are doing the weird mukbangs where they're eating weird animals. Not dog, not dogs, not eating dogs, but they're eating like soft shell turtles or frogs and things that look weird. But it's actually really funny because in some parts of America, they eat weird things too. They're eating frog in some parts you of America. You see somebody bite the head off of a roasted rabbit or squirrel in Duck Dynasty. I've eaten alligator meat at one of these festivals out in America, you know. I didn't think it was particularly but good. But we don't claim the southern states. They have their <laughs> Their own culture. In the you elitist. But what I'm saying is, um, I think this one, if you made me say how true it is, low, middle, high right now, I think it's more low. Yes. But low. on the internet comments, people still tease people. But I think in real life interactions, I'm I'm hearing a lot less of it. Um, how do you break this? Well, again, like, you know, like Asian Americans are just not doing this stuff. I can't control what happens in Asia. And in some corners of Asia, obviously, they are still doing stuff like this. But... I put it out a low, yeah, I honestly. Think it's a low. And even the truthiness is at a low. I'm not saying 0%, but definitely in the low zone. Number six, Andrew, the submissive Asian female. Mm. Um, this is an archetype, obviously, that transfers into dating life, I guess, more blatantly, but also possibly professional life as well. Oh, yeah, right? like no. People don't want to have an Asian female boss. 
small, smaller diminutive, not viewed as a alpha. Yeah. Also being over sexualized in the workplace plays against you. Uh, as I've it, definitely as it seen made... it. I've witnessed it. Obviously I'm yeah. not an Asian female myself. Uh, we have Asian women in our family. Yeah. Totally believable. But yeah. I think it varies a lot per sector. Like mm -hmm. the, some sectors are old world and they're going to operate off old world stereotypes. Some ones uh, try to break it. Yeah. If you're a really good looking woman who works in like fashion, obviously you're not going to get stereotyped and like all, it's not going to be a negative as if you work in some old school uh, industry. But anyways, uh, more we, comments, you know, <laughs> we made a whole video about it. We'll leave it right here. Guys. I actually think my takeaway is that it is just an overarching stereotype of Asians in general that we lack testosterone, but lacking testosterone for a woman is extra feminine. Lacking testosterone for a man is also extra feminine, but being hyper feminine as a woman is viewed differently as being hyper feminine for a man. Obvious for sure, man. And I would say how to break it. Listen, and, and this ties into the next stereotype, which number seven is the emasculated Asian male. And since they kind of come from the same place, I'm just going to clump them together. How to break it is like, to be honest, it comes down to the individual, right? And media. I'll say media is one side, but really how you live your own life. And listen, if you want to be a really uh, sexy Asian female, that's going to benefit your life in a certain way, but also there's pros there's, and cons. There's pros and cons. You to that. draw there's that a magic card, magic cards. They take a, hey, and the powerful cards, black Lotus. It takes yeah. a lot of mana yeah. and, and being uh, desirable on the dating apps. That's a pro and a con hundred percent. And I think that men and women, we have to take on some responsibilities. If I'm an emasculated Asian male, I have to take on some responsibility for myself and I have to figure out ways that I wanna break that myself. And you don't have to live your life, don't live every single moment of your life to break these stereotypes because at the end of the day, you gotta be you, but just know that you have some responsibility and that's what I would tell men and women. Honestly, I would say that these stereotypes of the submissive Asian female and the uh, emasculated Asian man that's weak, effeminate, nerdy, devoid of sexuality, I'm gonna go ahead and put this at somewhere between a medium and a high. Yeah. It might even, gun to my head, Andrew, I might just put it in the high category. Well, I'll just, I, I, I can't agree with you, I'll put it in the high, but like I said, each individual has some responsibility for their own actions and how they're perceived. Yeah, versus the yellow peril situation, you have way more individual movement yeah. in this. One, yellow peril is geopolitical. This is super micro and personal. Uh, moving on to number eight, Andrew, the unemotional or duplicitous friend or coworker. Duplicitous comes from the Latin word meaning double or twofold. It has to do with the kind of deception where you intentionally hide your true feelings or intentions behind false words or actions. So is this, does this at all relate to kind of the Japanese form of hospitality where they're like, oh, thank you so much. Arigato gozaimasu. And then they turn around and then like in their heart, they hate the, you. Know, Otomoshi, like, oh. right? Or the, um, I forgot. I the forgot. I for, we have forgot the name. I'll pop it up. But yeah, is it kind of like that where they're not talking about deceit deception as far as like oh I, um yeah i'm actually low-key a chinese spy yeah. they're just talking about like oh i just can't read you you're unemotional yeah. i, I can't actually understand. think this stereotype comes from the japanese because it actually started in the early 1990s um but i think it applies to all asians but like mm -hmm. probably even asians sometimes stereotype i'm not saying it's true but like japanese to be very like surface face and then inside face right right, right. and i mean overall overall you can tie it to the unemotional or stoic Asian parents. I would right? say this one is a medium uh, in terms of truthiness. Obviously, um, it's an older stereotype. I think people over 50, 60, 70, 80 years old in America are more likely to believe in it because of the Siamese cats from, uh, what's it called? Uh, was it Lady and the Tramp and stuff like that in 1955? I think that Jen Yang's character in Silicon Valley was kind of deceitful, but not in the super malicious way. The Nemoidians in Star Wars are based off Chinese Ming Dynasty people. Uh -huh. They were very deceitful and duplicitous. However, Andrew, I think there's another stereotype of Asian Americans that are more like fitting our archetype. I call it Tommy Toyota, which is basically this super helpful, earnest, like wasp guy from like the 1960s. Like, gee, Willikers, what can I do to help you guys? Because I remember I used to work selling wireless in college and all these rich white people were coming in from Issaquah being like, hey, do you happen to know Tommy Wong? He was our cabana boy in our Honolulu vacation. He was so helpful. He reminds me of you because you're helping me buy this Blackberry right now. So people were like putting me in the Tommy Toyota, Harold and Harold and Kumar. I'll help you. Yo, that's wild that you were in Washington and they were like, hey, you know this kid in Honolulu? He was nice too. You're, not, you're a nice Asian guy. You're great service boys.
Oh my god! No, literally, they were That's... hitting me with the ninety, the Tommy Toyota stereotype. All right, so you give this a medium. I'm gonna give this a medium, but it's it's difficult to say because, like we said, America's a big country. It's diverse. There's age ranges. There's racial ranges. There's income ranges, uh, educational ranges. It could vary. Plot what to what plot. I would say, how to break it, and it's not. I'm not gonna tell Asians to stop being helpful and stop being nice people and stop being polite. But I do think you gotta have this other side of you that you're strong, and you gotta get stronger, and you gotta either work out or gain some confidence somehow. Have some type of attitude behind you that you can defend yourself with or clap back at people with in case something goes off because the last thing you want to do is be this be a nice kind soft pushover docile pushover right be kind and nice but also have that edge to you right so. garden but still have the warrior side possibly you know it's, it's, it's up to you guys point number nine andrew the bad asian driver this is a uh, pretty common stereotype i'm gonna go ahead and put this right now in 2023 at a medium level, maybe possibly even high-low. Is it funny that the young Asians kind of have this fast and furious, in the night of Tokyo, isn't it like whip it around, race car. JDM like, exotics. Yeah, JDM exotics stereotype. Like, okay, we're fast drivers. We know how to drive. But then our older parents like are basically a liability. That's like the stereotype. Yeah, but you know what's interesting? I think people stereotype older Asian drivers that are immigrants as more timid, scared, driving 20 miles per hour under the speed limit. But definitely not like, uh, they're not like the people riding around like it's a rodeo all day. Yeah. It's like more like, gosh, this old guy in front of me is so scared he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Almost like a rookie 16, 17-year-old trainee driver. Right. I would say that most people describe Asians as annoying drivers and kind of clueless drivers at the worst level. Um, but what was that? Mark Norman, the comedian Mark Norman, had a really funny joke. Yeah, the, well, Mark Norman was acknowledging the government statistic that Asians by far had the lowest vehicular homicide or vehicular fatality accident rates. It's a third or a fourth of all the other major races in America. However, why are Asians stereotyped as the worst drivers? And Mark Norman acknowledges this in the joke, and he's like, yeah, it's because they actually cause a fatality for the car two, two cars down. Right. That they, was his way, a funny way of acknowledging the fact, but also explaining it away. Um, that was a funny yeah, way to flip it. But honestly, joke, but like I said, if you are driving too slow, what are the odds you're going to cause a fatality or a vehicular homicide death? That's from driving too fast or driving drunk. Yeah, I, I think driving, how to break this, it's just be more mindful when you drive. I mean, I have to remind our father, who is never has not really gotten any no, in no bad crash, hasn't hurt yet. anybody, has dinged up that the did, car. Yeah, and has he got honked at a few times? Possibly. Is it kind of annoying to be in the car with him? Ah, yeah, ah, but... Yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on to number 10, Andrew, the primitive Asian villager. This is the last anti-Asian stereotype that he had. He said basically stereotype that Asian Americans, especially the older ones, come from a place that is backwards, archaic, and primitive, and hold on to a lot of beliefs that have no place in modern Western society. Wow, so judgy. Um, I think, I guess if they're talking about the superstitions, but a lot of cultures and a lot of religions and a lot of like religions blend with the indigenous culture or like the shamanistic even like native culture so then there's like a whole thing from that but overall i would say this about the primitive villager what are you Asian. giving it low middle high i'm saying in some zones you could say it's medium to high yeah. but obviously some other zones it's like super not true I, I guess i would say i would say medium i would say just because there are a lot of asians that come from corners of asia that immigrate here and then they oftentimes if they don't adapt and assimilate they do want to live life kind of the way that they've been doing it. And let me just be clear. I'm going to keep it super real because I'm going to observe things about everybody. I'm not going to hold back on my observations about just like, oh, this is my group of people or whatever. There are some people that come from like, let's just say China, for example, super rural China. If you understand anything about the disparity in China, if you come from Shanghai, you might be super modern and know how to use all the modern tech and stuff like that. If you come from the deep villages, it's almost like you could be from like 1900. So you're taking somebody from the deep villages who potentially could have been raised in an environment that more mimics 1900 America than 2000s America and transporting to America. Of course, they're going to live their life in a way that to certain cutting edge Western people just seems like completely anachronistic and out of time. Yeah. Like they get hit we're in a time machine. Yeah. And it also depends on how it's executed. You know, I remember growing up in Seattle, there was, we had some Pacific Islander friends that would dig a big ditch in their yard and roast a big pig in front of it. But they actually got in trouble by the police because- Cause a fire. Yeah. Well, you're not supposed to just start a bonfire and roast a pig in like your yard. 
Like, you know, in America, there's like rules and stuff like that. Even though I could tell you a lot of places and corners of America where they like to do that too, but they might be doing it in a state that allows it or in a slightly different manner. So what I'm saying is I think a lot of these primitive villager things, it's actually not that different than some of the things you see in America, but it could just be also seen with another layer of like, oh, they're they're a diff- from a different culture. And I'm not going to lie, like the Western culture has been the predominant culture globally for the last like 300, 400 years. But some corners of Asia, they didn't get as much of that, uh, those update packs or whatever you want to call it, the Westernization packs. So obviously we're living in the West now. It just seems yeah. some of the things, the medicines, people yeah. catching fish out of the ocean or whatever, like that's selling it in, the, on, in a bucket on the side of the street. That's like one of the more like old school things I've yeah. seen. But- like- you know what I mean? But For sure what? it's old school. It is a, of a bygone era. And I, I'm going to say this. The word primitive, though, I think that is the biggest offense right here. A villager, you know, you can take offense to that. Yeah, I get a it. Country boy. But primitive, a country, country boy. But primitive is wrong because it's not like we're just picking it out of fish. And it's not and like that person's just like, ah, like a caveman walking around, doesn't yeah. know how to move. Like. I think a better way is just like they're low tech and they're simple sometimes. And that's what the villagers from Asia are like. They're low tech, they're simple, they want yeah. the simple and life. I'm gonna break this to be honest, when I do see it, and I'm not saying all oh, Asians even fit into this at all, but I'm sure everybody's seen it before. Like if I see somebody around like the city and they're doing something that is like, oh man, this person just from the villages. They didn't fully know how to move. I will try to say it in yeah. language because I speak multiple dialects in language to that person to try to educate them. Whether they take it or not, I don't know. Yeah. But I'm just doing my part to try to bring them up to speed. Yeah. And listen, I think if you're somebody who really wants to break this, I think the things that you can do is, right, communicate with people. I mean, you can call out the behaviors if you think it's wrong. And to be honest, not all behaviors from this part or that world is necessarily what you should be doing in America because there's obviously laws against it. But ultimately, like, you can call it out. Or if you want to think about high-tech Asian stuff, there is a lot of high-tech, like Japan, South Korea. Obviously, China has a lot of high-tech Yeah, Asian it's crazy because it's like all the high-tech. This person got like an Oppo phone that's like super up to date, but they're like just catching fish in a yeah. bucket. I don't know. Anyway, um, for their detrimental impact, inherently flawed basis on AAPIs and Asians all over the world, these stereotypes are the ones that have no place left in a diverse and informed world society. They all need to go, but it is our part as productive members of society to call them out when we see them or hear them. That is the end of the article. And real quick, we got to get into some quick flash reactions. Somebody said, are these stereotypes or just generalizations? Because I feel like these things about Asians were just rooted in some observable fact. Um, this is true, right? I mean, that's what a stereotype is, but obviously I don't like the word fact because just say it's observation. There's no observable fact because if it's a fact, it's a fact. It's not observable anyways. Somebody said, uh, is per capita income PPP a generalization of a country's wealth? Yes, because every country, there are rich, middle tier, and poor people, but it's a pretty good statistic to see the economic health of a country in the big picture. These are just overarching country metrics, right? So basically what they're saying is, yeah, of course, like we were said earlier, we acknowledged it. There's some shred of truth in stereotypes, but people oversimplify them and they over apply them because they don't care enough about a group to paint it with the nuance and know when something is being archetypical or like typical or not. I think the biggest mistake that people make with stereotypes is that in your head, you will stereotype everybody. I don't care how much you are against the word stereotype. You'll probably use generalizations in your mind. But I think it's when you treat people differently based off of that dumb oversimplified stereotype. And if you treat people differently based off of it, then you're wrong. That's the wrong part. And you know what it is too? It's almost like people get four brushes to paint a photo. And they're like, yep, these are the stereotype brushes. Uh, There is more nuance in this, but this is just your starter pack. And then the people are like, well, the starter pack's all I need. I only need these four colors. And you go, well, there's another advanced pack, just like crayons. You know how you can buy the four pack, the eight pack, the 16, the 32, the 64, 128. But they're like, nope. I'm good with these four basic ones because uh, that's all I need because that's all I care about this group. And I think that that's the messed up part. Like you said, right. people are not trying to move past firmware 1.0. They don't want to go to 1.5 or 2.0 to, to flesh it all out. Yo, I, this one comment is actually pretty funny. It says, wait, how can Asian women be submissive and sexual when they're also the tiger moms? And they have all the high expectations and they're super naggy. That's not sexual. Yeah, like I said, some of these stereotypes are like, is it does it change per era does yeah. it change once you get married are we talking about different types of girls like that's why it's so ridiculous even though stereotypes like we said we're acknowledging it i'm not gonna be one of those people to tell you stereotypes are 100 percent untrue but i'm just saying 
they're, they're so misapplied. Right. I mean, honestly, once you break one stereotype, sometimes there's a new stereotype that becomes uh, true. It's oh, like, Andrew, we're all the drug doing party Asians yeah. that are breaking the model minority. Hey, and- you guys remember this stereotype from a long time ago? All Asians know Kung Fu. And then guess what? People found out that we, a lot of Asians don't know martial arts. Yeah. And then now Asians are weak. And I'm like, oh, which one is it? That's true, man. And then, you know, everybody was going against the martial arts stereotype, but some people were like, dude, at least people were scared of us when we struck a stance. Yeah, I don't know, guys. Let us know what you think of the comment section below. Like I said, great list from Next Shark. The comment sections went all around the world and back. Like I said, some people were here. Some people were over there. Let us know what you think. Um, keep it civil. Until next time, we're the Hot Pop Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.